now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a young man phoning a town's youth council. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Youth Council. Caroline speaking. Oh, hello. I'm interested in standing for election to the Youth Council and I was told to give you a call. That's good. Could I have your name, please? Yes, it's Roger Brown. Thank you. I'm Caroline, the Youth Council Administrator. So, do you know much about what the Council does, Roger? I've talked to Stephanie. I think she's the Chair of the Council. That's right. And she told me a lot about it. How it's a way for young people to discuss local issues, for example and make suggestions to the town council. That's what made me interested. Fine. Well, let me take down some of your details. First of all, how old are you? You know the council is for young people aged from 13 to 18. I've just turned 18. And where do you live, Roger? Uh, well, that's a bit complicated. At the moment, I'm looking for a flat to rent here. So I'm in a hostel from Monday to Friday. I go back to my parents' place at the weekend. OK. So where's the best place to send you some information about the council? Oh, to my parents' address, please. That's 17 Buckley Street, B-U-C-K-L-E-I-G-H Street, Stamford, Lincolnshire. Though you don't really need the county. Oh, I know Stamford. It's a lovely town. And what's the postcode? P-E-9-7-Q-T. Right, thank you. So are you working here or are you a student? I started studying at the university a couple of weeks ago and I've got a part-time job for a few hours a week. What do you do? Well, I've done several different things. I've just finished a short-term contract as a courier and now I'm working as a waiter in one of the big hotels. Uh-huh. That can't leave you much time for studying. Oh, it's not too bad. I managed to fit it all in. What are you studying? My ambition is to go into Parliament eventually, so my major subject is politics. That's partly why I think the Youth Council is important and want to be a part of it. And I suppose you're also taking a minor subject, aren't you? I know a lot of people study economics too. I chose history. To be honest, I'm not finding it as interesting as I expected. Before you hear the rest of the phone call, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. OK, so with your studying and your part-time job, 
Do you have time for any other interests or hobbies? Well, I spend quite a lot of time cycling, both around town to get to university and to work, and also long distance, from here to London, for instance. That's pretty impressive. Anything else? For relaxation, I'm also keen on the cinema. I used to go at least once a week, but I can't manage to go so often now. Right. Are you sure you'll have enough time for the Youth Council? Yes, I've worked out that I can afford to reduce my hours at work and that will make the time. So is there any particular aspect of the Youth Council's work that appeals to you, Roger? Well, my sister is blind, so I'm particularly interested in working with disabled young people to try and improve the quality of their lives. That's great. Well, the best way to get involved is to be nominated by some people who you know. Right. Can you tell me how to set about organising that? You should talk to Geoffrey, our elections officer. I can arrange a meeting in the council office with him, if you like. Yes, please. He'll be here next Monday, if that suits you. That's the 14th, isn't it? Yes. I can manage late afternoon. Would you like to suggest a time? He generally leaves around 5.30. Well, would 4.30 be OK? My last class finishes at four, so I'd have plenty of time to get to your office. Right, that's fine. Oh, and could I have a phone number we can contact you on? Yes, my mobile number's 077881367311. Thank you. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a radio programme giving parents advice about buying cots for their babies to sleep in. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello and welcome to today's Buyer Beware programme, where we give you some tips on how to spend your money wisely. Now, in today's show, we're looking at beds for children and babies. Let's start by looking at baby cots. That's for children of up to three years old. We tested three different cots, all in the budget price range, and, as usual, we will feature the good points, the problems, and our verdict. The first cot we looked at was by BabySafe, and it had several good points to recommend it. Our testers liked the fact that it had four wheels, so it was easy to move around. The only slight problems with this cot were that it had no brakes, but they didn't think that mattered too much. At first they were a bit concerned about the sidebar because they felt babies could trap their fingers in it, 
but our testers felt that this was unlikely to happen, so they've given this one a verdict of satisfactory. The next cot was by Choice Cots, and this time our testers were pleased to find a cot which is simple to put together, unlike others we looked at. On the minor side, our testers did not like the fact that the side of the cot did not drop down, making it difficult to pick up newborn babies. However, the real problem with this cot was the space between the bars. Our testers found they were too wide and a baby could easily trap his head. We felt this was a real safety hazard and so we've labelled this one dangerous, I'm afraid. Before you hear the rest of the programme, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Based on Crackles with Rob's website. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. And finally, better news for the mother's choice cot. This cot was slightly different in that although the sidebar did not drop down, the base could be raised or lowered into two different positions, making it safe as well as convenient. The negatives for this one were quite minor. The only niggle everyone had was the fact that it has no wheels, and the only other problem anyone could find was that there were pictures, which were simply stuck on and so could easily become detached. The makers have now promised to discontinue this practice, as this cot will then be safe in every way. We have made the Mother's Choice cot our best buy. Congratulations, Mother's Choice. So what features should you look for in a baby's cot? Well, obviously, safety is a very important factor, as well as comfort and convenience. We recommend that if you are buying a cot, do make sure that any metal present is not rusted or bent in any way. You should ensure your cot has only rounded or smooth edging without any sharp edges. This is especially important for wooden cots. And now, on to beds for toddlers. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a textile design student called Jim discussing his project on using natural dyes for colouring fabrics with his tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Okay, Jim, you wanted to see me about your textile design project. That's right. I've been looking at how a range of natural dyes can be used to colour fabrics like cotton and wool. Why did you choose that topic? Well, I got a lot of useful ideas for the museum, you know, at that exhibition of textiles. But I've always been interested in anything to do with colour. Years ago, I went to a carpet shop with my parents when we were on holiday in Turkey, and I remember all the amazing colours. They might not all have been natural dyes. Maybe not. But for the project, I decided to follow it up. And I found a great book about a botanic garden in California that specialises in plants used for dyes. OK. So, in your project... 
you had to include a practical investigation. Yeah. At first, I couldn't decide on my variables. I was going to just look at one type of fibre, for example, like cotton. And see how different types of dyes affected it? Yes. Then I decided to include others as well. So I looked at cotton and wool and nylon. With just one type of dye? Various types, including some that weren't natural, for comparison. OK. So I did the experiments last week. I used some ready-made natural dyes. I found a website which supplied them. They came in just a few days, but I also made some of my own. That must have taken quite a bit of time. Yes. I thought it'd just be a matter of a teaspoon or so of dye, and actually that wasn't the case at all. Like, I was using one vegetable, a beetroot, for a red dye, and I had to chop up a whole pile of it. So it all took longer than I'd expected. One possibility is to use food colourings. I did use one. That was a yellow dye, an artificial one. Tatrazine? Yeah. I used it on cotton first. It came out a great colour. But when I rinsed the material, the colour just washed away. I'd been going to try it out on nylon, but I abandoned that idea. Were you worried about health issues? I thought if it's a legal food colouring, it must be safe. Well, it can occasionally cause allergic reactions, I believe. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So what natural dyes did you look at? Well, one was turmeric. The colour's great. It's a really strong yellow. It's generally used in dishes like curry. It's meant to be quite good for your health when eaten, but you might find it's not permanent when it's used as a dye. A few washes and it's gone. Right. I used beetroot as a dye for wool. When I chop up beetroot to eat, I always end up with bright red hands. But the wool ended up just a sort of watery cream shade. Disappointing. There's a natural dye called Tyrian purple. Have you heard of that? Yes. It comes from a shellfish, and it was worn in ancient times, but only by important people, as it was so rare. I didn't use it. It fell out of use centuries ago, though one researcher managed to get hold of some recently. But that shade of purple can be produced by chemical dyes nowadays. Did you use any black dyes? Logwood. That was quite complicated. I had to prepare the fabric so the dye would take. I hope you were careful to wear gloves. Yes, I know the danger with that dye. Good, it can be extremely dangerous if it's ingested. Now, presumably you had a look at an insect-based dye, like cochineal, for example. Yes, I didn't actually make that. I didn't have time to start crushing up insects to get the red colour. And anyway, they're not available here. But I managed to get the dye quite easily from a website. But it cost a fortune. I can see why it's generally just used in cooking and in small quantities. Yes, it's very effective, but that's precisely why it's not used as a dye. I also read about using metal oxide. Apparently, you can allow iron to rust while it's in contact with the fabric, and that colours it. Yes, that works well for dyeing cotton. But you have to be careful, as the metal can actually affect the fabric, and so you can't expect to get a lot of wear out of fabrics treated in this way. And the colours are quite subtle. Not everyone likes them. Anyway, it looks as if you've done a lot of work. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three.
Part 4 You are going to hear a lecture about various issues in land management and ownership systems by Professor Fred Roberts. You now have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Good morning everyone. Good to see you all looking so full of energy. Today I'm going to give an overview of some general principles and issues relating to land management and ownership. Very important. If we look at history, it seems that much of it concerns conflict over religion, economic power and land. Often all three factors are involved together. The first question one asks when talking about land is, who owns it? What you can do with land you own depends on one's political views. A far-right conservative may say ownership is the socially supported power to do what you want with the land you own, with no control by government as long as what you do with it doesn't hurt others. You can imagine how different factions interpret hurt others. By contrast, the political left, socialists and more to the left, communists say land ownership, private land ownership that is, is the root cause of much injustice in the world, and that the social protection of private land ownership can result in tyranny and oppression. They therefore argue for state, public and cooperative forms of land ownership. I would mention here that most of us take for granted the idea that everything must be owned by a person, people or an organisation. But some societies, notably some native North American tribes, seem to have no concept of personal ownership. It was normal for them simply to take anything they needed and for others to take it from them if they needed it. When European settlers came, the Indians behaved as usual, which led the Europeans to seeing them as thieves. But the European settlers grabbed the Native Americans' land, their most important possession. So who were the real thieves? However, in this day and age, it would be futile to think of getting rid of the concept of ownership. But let me return to land ownership. It's a complex issue. For example, should the owner have exclusive control over the rights of way, like traditional footpaths, or the migration routes of wild animals, or the ecologically important wetlands? Should the owner be allowed to destroy the whole lot by building expensive houses everywhere? Or what if the owner discovers hidden treasure that once belonged to the royal family? All such things raise questions of the rights of the owner as opposed to the rights of others, including animals, perhaps. Clearly, divergent views on such questions are a constant source of argument. What did the classical economists say about land ownership? Their positions were often rather ambiguous. Many of them seemed to consider it a necessary evil, and argued that it could not be defended if there was not some obligation to keep and improve the land. This is the concept of stewardship, that the land must be kept in good condition for future generations. But what if the owners were good stewards of their vast estates, but millions were going hungry? The Marxist answer was, and still is, land reform as a means of social justice. And in the 20th century, I mentioned ecological issues just now. Other reasons for legally restricting the rights of landowners have emerged. You can't cut the trees down because it would cause soil erosion that can spoil rivers hundreds of miles away. Pollution, the need to protect biodiversity, things that reduce the level of what we called nature's services to the general public. 
all have led to more restrictions on landowners' rights, at least in some countries, especially Europe. At the same time, property taxes have steadily increased to pay for essential services offered by the state or local government, such as firefighting. As these threats to the health of our planet get more serious, some people have argued that the ownership of natural capital, forests, wetlands, etc., will more and more be controlled by communal and not by private bodies. For example, the use by multinational companies of native plant varieties for modified crops and new drugs, plants that they seldom paid for in the past, are now increasingly recognised as belonging to the cultures or ecosystems from which they originated. But it seems to me that having the land and its flora and fauna owned by governments is no guarantee that they'll be used wisely, rather than for short-term profit. The evidence is that local ownership protected by law is usually the best answer. OK, it will soon be time for a break, but before we have our coffee, I will give the answers to the two questions I asked you last time. What are the differences between leasehold and freehold? Essentially, the former allows possession for a limited time, while the latter is a special right granting the full use of real estate for an indeterminate time. In this country, most houses are sold with the land and the house itself freehold, whereas many flats are sold with a lease which was issued by the freeholder to the original leaseholder. The flat is then effectively owned by the leaseholder for an agreed number of years. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Acing IELTS Task 2 and getting a band 9 requires a strong foundation in various areas. Here are some key strategies to put you on the right track. Grasp the prompt. Before diving in, thoroughly understand the question. Identify the task type. Discuss both sides. Argue a point, etc. And answer all parts of it. Don't miss out on points by overlooking key aspects. Plan and structure. Don't underestimate the power of planning. Brainstorm ideas. Formulate a clear thesis statement, and structure your essay logically with a strong introduction, well-developed body paragraphs, and a concluding summary. Lure the reader in, craft an engaging introduction that grabs the examiner's attention. This could be a thought-provoking statement, a relevant anecdote, or a background setting the stage for your arguments. Develop compelling paragraphs. Each body paragraph should focus on a single supporting point for your thesis. Include relevant examples, evidence, or explanations to substantiate your claims. Ensure smooth transitions between paragraphs to maintain a clear flow of ideas. Showcase language skills. A band 9 demands a sophisticated use of English. Utilize a diverse vocabulary that goes beyond basic words. Employ a range of complex sentence structures.